what I usually do when I have to stand up and do, make these kinds of presentations is to uh, do a lot of uh, work where I share projects with you and I talk about the, uh, the, 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 the individual um, programs that we've been uh, making. However, um, what I'm going to do today is to try and share a bit more of our research background with you and some of the thinking that's been coming up out of the work that we've been doing. So um, when we were first invited to come and do a, um, a breakout session, uh, we imagined it might be slightly less formal. We imagined that breaking out would involve us being in a room and having a bit of a workshop sort of experience where we could work together, instead of which we find ourselves in these rather august surroundings. So um, bear with us as we try to put together something which for us is the, a contingent attempt to put together a number of different elements from our research to give you some insight into the underpinning uh, background and methods. I want to introduce the two people on the stage with me. Um, first of all, Bill Sharp, to my immediate right, um, visiting professor at the University of the West of England's Digital Cultures Research Centre. Center. He's the ex-head of the HP European Lab, uh, which is based in Bristol, where he worked all the way through the 90s, working with mobile and pervasive computing. He founded his own company called the Appliance Studio after that, and now works as a consultant for the International Futures Forum. The thinking represented in Bill's book, Economies of Life, has been a key influence, both on our main partners, Watershed in Bristol, and also on our own philosophy and approach, and I wanted Bill to be here today to present some of that uh, to this uh, meeting. Uh, next to Bill is Simon Morton. Simon's our research fellow for REACT. Um, he's coming uh, to us uh, from a, um, a PhD and some postdoc work and being dumped into the, uh, the messy business of working with the creative economy um, and being given a crash course over the last three weeks in data visualisation. So Simon's going to be presenting some of his... Um, original research that he's done with our partners. So who are we? We are um, Watershed, uh, the Digital Arts and Film Centre in Bristol, together with the University of the West of England, and our partners are Bath, Bristol, Cardiff and Exeter Universities. Uh, we have a bunch of creative companies in our network, many, many, many micro-businesses. One of the things that came up in that last question from uh, Georgina Follett to David Willits was about SMEs. Well, actually, most of the people we work with don't even get to being SMEs. They're micro-businesses. They were three, four, five, six people operations, and that tends to be where we find the take-up is for the uh, university sector interventions into the creative economy space. We have some technology partners. We work with local agencies like, like, like the LEPS and Creative England uh, in, in Bristol uh, and the Arts Council. So we have a bunch of, we have a network of, of partners. When we started out, we had the idea that what we needed to do was to um, really pioneer a process of culture change, that universities and businesses in the creative sector weren't very good at talking to each other. And in order for them to become good at talking to each other, we needed to do two things. The first thing was to build a network of relationships. And that's really, really important. We wanted to build a network of relationships. And you'll see as we play through the, pro, the, the session today that that's, what, that's what's at the heart of, um, in many ways, the heart of what we're going to be talking about. So we think of REACT as a system for the co-production and circulation of knowledge. The other problem that we, that we faced was the, the massive problem of time scale, which is to say that creative economy businesses turn over very fast. They're interested in what happens this, this quarter, this six months, this year. University academics tend to be thinking about the book that they're going to publish in three years' time that will be read for 15 years. In other words, we have a fairly geological timescale as opposed to the creative economy that has a much more rapid turnover. And we felt that we really needed to have a gearing system that would match those two different temporalities together in some kind of a way. Today what we want to discuss is how we try to maximise benefit from the human networks of creativity where the idea of an ecology is more than a metaphor but a practical map to impact and value creation. The presentation is going to go on a little journey from a bit of ecological philosophy is how I sort of think of it, um, drawing on business and organisation studies through to some empirical research that we've done. We've done some new work for this session, thanks AHRC, on uh, data visualisation, analysing and visualising the ways that REACT is enhancing the human connections in our network by fostering and focusing connectivity and new relationships. 
And we want to propose that a hub is a metaphorical structure of dependence, but that a network encourages peer-to-peer -peer creativity and learning with a structure of emergence, sustainability, and growth. So we want to contrast this structure with this structure, essentially, as part of our presentation today. Um, with that introduction, I'm going to hand over to Bill, who's going to take us through some of the background to the thinking that we're trying to enact in our hub. Bill, thank you. Thanks, John. Good morning. As John said, we've been working on an ecological understanding of networks and value creation. This is something I've been doing since before the React Hub with Dick Penny and the others in the watershed for six or seven years now, trying to see whether we could stabilize the way we talk about value in a way that was then going to be useful for organizational work. And I think we've really got to that point. Not that we could possibly answer all questions you might have about that language, but there is a, a way of looking at this that has roots in two areas. One is the field of inactive psychology, founded by Francisco Varela, that has a way of looking at value as enacted in the interactions we have with our environment, the bringing forth of a world from a, from a life. And the other is quite a long strand of activity that goes back about 20 years in um, business strategy um, from Richard Norman and Rafael Ramirez, um, and I would now work with Rafael Ramirez, really looking at um, the intellectual origins of the ideas of value and how we can put them to practical use in, in organizational strategy. And I'm just going to try and summarize that to point you towards the work that you could follow up on if, if you're interested. So first, to take John's point, I'm not trying to talk metaphorically here. I'm trying to ground our language in a way that offers a continuity um, with stable scientific concepts that we use in other areas and put those to work in, in the domain of art and culture and creativity. And the first step is this word ecosystem, which has quite a clear definition as being a community and a habitat. So the habitat is, well, here we are, we're in one habitat, uh, the watershed is another. And community has the meaning not of a single species, but of all the interacting life forms that together inhabit that particular place. And this draws attention to the fundamental property of life, that life is inherently interactional. There is no life that doesn't interact. And what distinguishes ecosystems is the variety and density of those interactions. And basically, interactional diversity is what drives growth in an ecosystem, and ecosystems tend towards greater variety and density of interaction, given some inputs of energy and resources and everything else. So what you immediately think about when you see an ecosystem, then, is variety. And that variety is not for any particular species in it. If you say, what's an ecosystem for? It's not for anything in particular. It just is. And there is no one thing called value circulating there. There are just many different qualities of life. And if you look at any one particular life in it, it interacts with everything else around its own purposes. So the next step you can take is that the concept of value arises when you, so to speak, look over the shoulder of one particular thing in that environment and say, how does this whole ecosystem look if you are a flower, a bee, a bacterium, a cat, a fox, a human? And each life, in its interaction with everything else, sees that ecosystem with a particular perspective of value. It, so to speak, casts a web of significance over that world, which interacts with everyone else's web of significance. You know, and the fox regards the rabbit in one way, and the rabbit regards the fox in another way. They are mutual, they're not agreed. So there's not one value, there's an infinite variety of values. And we get stuck, I think, in a lot of discussions because value, you know, we have this problem of reducing value to a single metric, like money or something else, and that causes us to get really puzzled. Um, well, there isn't one metric of value. It's infinite in its variety, and it arises as a perspective on a pattern of relationships in which a life is embedded. So if we now move this over into the... Um, domain of organizational life and something like, like the React Hub. This is a very simple and general sort of diagram. And the circular bubbles are meant just to represent um, actors in the um, ecosystem. And the square blobs are something that we, you would call a product, an offering, something that's put out there by one of those, those actors around which some sort of interaction can happen. 
Um, so in the case of a company like Apple, a pretty big, hefty company, they put out a platform called iTunes. They do lots of other things. There's the other, other blobs. And from that platform, they configure interactions between music publishers and artists. And then if you look at the publishers and artists, they interact in one or two ways, and the colors are meant to represent who's the dominant player in each interaction. So a music publisher does things to configure how a music artist might get their, uh, their music out there. Similarly, the artist maybe configures an event and a show in such a way that um, the music publisher is then configured in what they do. So that's just taking this idea that each organization, each actor in an ecosystem, configures value creation for other people. And so none of us lives a life on our own. In what we do around us, we create a possibility of value creation for ourselves, but also for other people. And then those all interact and make up one overall value constellation. And I put the language there. There are really two equivalent terms. Value constellation draws your attention to the, the static nature of the structure, and the value creating system more creates an understanding that this is an ongoing process of value creation and maintaining the, re the relationships. This really replaces the linear industrial view of the value chain. And this work on value constellations was done about 20 years ago, but is really coming to the fore now that we're all living in a world of co production. So the old language was value was put into a thing, delivered to the, us as consumers, who then used it up. We consumed it. But the notion of value has another intellectual he history in terms of consummation revealing value. And now that we're into this world where everybody's taking part in everything, with the notion of co-production, the idea of a value constellation rather than a value chain is now coming into the foreground in, in business strategy work. So just to sum up the, the, the five main conceptual um, tools we've got, first is that every organization can be viewed as the focus of its own value constellation. And a value constellation is what you do to intentionally design the value creating activities around you whether it's creating a work of art, creating a technological platform, creating business opportunities, or in the case of the hub, designing certain things like the, meet the sandbox process by which other people can come and interact in a particular sort of way. Rather than talking about products, we talk about offerings, that which you put offer out there which encourages other people to bring their own value co-production processes into play, and an offering is just whatever you do that does that in your value constellation, the little square boxes on my diagram. Value is created or enacted, brought into being by the way we interact with things, friend, foe, whatever we like, food, poison, encounter with a work of art. It all depends on how we encounter the thing. So value is created by each actor in the constellation for themselves through their actions and interactions. Really important, there is no one such thing as value. It's a perspective that arises from a particular point of view. Um, and there are at least as many values in an ecosystem as there are actors, and usually a lot more. Value constellations, then, are all part of one ecosystem. They, they interact in an ecosystem, and you can only find out what a value constellation is, in a particular instance, by seeing the ecosystem it's in. And there's a good deal of confusion in the language out there, because the, the common way of using business ecosystem is to characterize something like the Android or the iTunes or whatever as a business ecosystem which rather confuses the point, because from the perspective of this language, those things are just really big, hefty, powerful value constellations. They're ones that dominate an awful lot of people rather powerfully. But it's really more helpful to regard them as that value constellations within a bigger ecosystem, and then the language doesn't get, get so confused. OK, I hope that's provided a bit of useful language. And the... Um, oh, it's not in there. Um, there is a slide, I think, going up on the, the set, which just gives some references to the background to this work. At the end. At the end. OK. OK. Thanks, Bill. That's great. So that's a little theoretical background. That's given you something to think about, hasn't it? Something to chew on. Hmm. You know, we got chin stroking going out there in the audience. Yeah, what is that? What's all that about? So, what you need to understand about React is the context with, in which we try to enact some of that theoretical thinking. Um, we're based at the watershed in Bristol, which is itself um, a hub uh, in a provincial city 
that coordinates various kinds of um, cultural activity and value creating activity uh, in, in, the, in the way that Bill's just described it. Um, we are based specifically in one part of that uh, institution, which is called the Pervasive Media Studio. And the Pervasive Media Studio, hi everybody in the studio, if you're there watching on live stream, I hope you're having a good day, um, if, uh, is, uh, is, is a, um, a collaborative uh, co-located innovation lab. Um, and there are some key things about the studio that um, are important to understand in the way that we work. Uh, the studio is a collection of artists, designers, researchers and engineers. The studio gives people free desk space on the basis of residences. It also supports and looks for funding for projects. Uh, and it has two university partnerships, both with my own university, the University of the West of England and also with Bristol University. So it's a university innovation creativity centre. It's a hub, if, of, uh, I suppose, in one way. It's a studio network in another. Now, we did, some, we did some work with them uh, um, the year before last. Bill and I worked on a research project with people in the studio, actually as part of the Connected Communities uh, HRC programme, a small project. And in that work, we said to people, we, we wanted to find out what was of value to people in this world, in this network, in this, in this, uh, in this community. Um, so we, we set out to ask people what they valued, what was of value to them in this world. And what we found back was people talked about all kinds of things like the quality of interpersonal relationships was important to them. Trust was important to them. Resolving conflict, knowing that they could resolve conflict together was important to them. Enabling their own personal development was important. Collaboration, which might take the form of information, technological know-how, creative inspiration. Um, and then a sense that they all had of generating a set of shared values around things like artistic endeavour, novelty and risk. Uh, and I used artistic endeavour specifically in contradistinction to creativity in more general terms or, or the creative economy in a, in a bigger uh, sense. Um, one of the ways that the Pervasive Media Studio set itself up, and Bill and I were both involved in, 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 in doing that, along with uh, Claire Reddington and Dick Penny and a bunch of other people uh, in Bristol, was the idea of keeping money at the margins. In order to generate ideas and generate partnerships and generate collaboration and generate new businesses, it seemed to be really important to keep money at the margins of the, at the beginning of the conversation and to make a space where people could exchange freely without that, um, without that pressure. So Bill's idea about the value constellation can be applied to business and social enterprises that, that, that curate um, processes of co-production uh, in which uh, each resident in our studio network uh, is supported in a unique and individual way while operating a kind of gift economy at the overall level in which they agree to share the fruits of their ideas and their labour in order to produce something, an outcome both for themselves and also for the community as a whole. So we've tried to translate this into our work in the Creative Economy Hub partnering up businesses and academics by adapting a process that um, uh, I shared uh, in the studio had already developed called the Sandbox. Uh, and the Sandbox is a co-production method which, is, uh, which belongs to, um, to, to, to I shared. Um, and we've adapted it, we've bought, bought it in as our primary methodology of putting academics and businesses together. So in a sandbox, what happens? Well, we put out a call. First of all, we have a themed, we have a theme. And um, so far, we've done books and print, we've done heritage, we've done future documentary, we're currently working on the Internet of Things. We decide on a theme with our business partners and we, we put out a call. We then uh, invite people to come to ideas labs, uh, usually about 100 people in three different locations. That's to say 100, 120 people all together attend ideas labs. They then generate a bunch of ideas and connections and contacts, which we then curate into a series of applications and an application procedure, uh, and we um, award money. The principle in this is that of crowding diversity, of trying to get lots of different kinds of people together from the ideas lab through to funneling them into this sandbox process, where there'll be lots of peer-to-peer -peer learning and lots of support, and we offer people a lot of mentoring during that sandbox process itself. Uh, we, we, we do, we do uh, uh, lots of development, we offer lots of IP advice, we offer marketing advice, we get business advisors in, one of them is Mark Lever sitting in the audience back there. We get lots of different people in to work with our project. So they feel as though they're getting a lot of attention in quite a, 
and a three-month process which has got milestones towards the iteration of a prototype at the end of the, of the, end of the program. So we expect people to make something that works by the end of three months and they get lots of support to get to that point uh, over that time scale. Now, what's happening in here? Well, we think we can see, and I hope that you'll be able to see when you get hold of one of our lovely catalogues, um, that we've got, first of all, we've got new partnerships emerging from what we've done so far in the first two years. We know there are lots of new relationships that weren't, weren't there before, so we're building relationships. Uh, secondly, we know that actually academics are going back into universities and writing new research bids and going, oh, I didn't quite think I'd get a research bid out of this, but actually I've got some new partners, I've got some new ways of working, I've got some new ways of thinking about the world, and they're going, they're going back and writing research bids that come out of our process. We also know that university partners are going back to the classroom very frequently and saying, do you know what, I really want to change the way I teach now. I think I can run that lab process or I can borrow from that sandbox process or that ideas lab and I can use that to generate ideas. Some of, so some of the methods from a creative economy partner are feeding back into our classrooms, which is amazing. Um, we're also, of course, designing new products and services, some of which are going to go on into the marketplace for the companies uh, who are involved in our collaborations. And we've got new businesses starting up as a result of the process. So there's a whole lot of outcomes, and I call them emergent outcomes deliberately. Um, our, our aims were to create partnerships, to create relationships, um, and to build a, a mesh of relationships between businesses and universities across our region. And we've taken this network-based approach to doing that. And in a network, things emerge. We didn't really expect people to change their teaching practices. We weren't altogether sure that people would write new research bids. So there were lots of things that emerge out of the process. And I'll go on and talk about that in more detail at a micro level in a moment. So uh, that's, the, that's, the, that's the claim. That's a series of claims. We have a, an approach based upon some of Bill's thinking, some of the thinking done by colleagues before us in the, in the, in the watershed that we've adapted and adopted. Uh, and we have a set of claims and we have a set of projects. Uh, we've also got some evidence. Look, it's data. Hooray. Um, we, we, what we've done is to go to our, um, one of our uh, sandbox networks, uh, the books and print sandbox. So what we do was go to our books and print uh, partners and interview them which we would do anyway, as a matter of course. Then we went back to those interviews and we looked to see um, what, we've, uh, what, num what new connections people made in the process of the sandbox. Yeah? So we tried to identify what new connections people had made and we tried to make some inferences about the value of those connections to them based upon what, what, what they said and also what we knew about uh, how the project had progressed subsequently to its uh, uh, original iteration based upon how strong and how valuable those connections were. So it's a first sketch, a model that we hope begins to prove the case that we've been trying to make. And when we've made this case before, people go, yeah, well, I sort of get it. I sort of get the, 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 eco, the ecosystem model. I kind of get the network model, but I don't really see it in action. I don't, I, don't, I don't really understand it. I see a lot of discrete projects. So this is an attempt to visualize what we think is actually happening in our process. So we took location data, identity data, interview information, and we put them, Simon and another researcher, put them into some tables that then got translated to a software called Gephi, which starts to then produce these kinds of um, graphs and, um, um, and diagrams. I'll break this down for you. So first of all, these are, our idea these are the people that came to our ideas labs. So each one of these, Cardiff, Bristol, Exeter, then we had an ideas lab in each one of those places. The dark blue uh, blobs are academics, the light blue blobs are businesses. Uh, so those are the people that actually originally attended our ideas labs. Uh, the other blobs that are on the big map are uh, the, um, first of all, the, that's, the, that's the, um, uh, the academics, the research partners, then the creative business partners, then the, 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 those, those pink blobs are our mentors. We have a bunch of mentors that we bring into the sandbox process to actually uh, uh, support and advise. And they're usually uh, really quite high-powered people uh, brought in from the uh, cultural sector that we're working within. Um, that's us, that's the React team, my producers, uh, myself, Claire Reddington, the executive director, various other people that we bring in from time to time, uh, Alison, Simon, uh, there's, a, there's about actually five and a half of us who are full-time delivering the program, but we frequently bring in other people. And that's the number of bids that were developed out of the original set. So 
the, the dark green ones are the ones that we funded. The light green ones are the ones that we didn't fund. Some of the light green ones have a life of their own. Some of them go off and get high money from universities. Some of them go off to the uh, Nesta Digital R&D Fund. Some of them uh, 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 find other ways into the world. Uh, some of them uh, form relationships that actually then go off and do something else, something different, not the bid that they thought they were going to come to us with. So we count all those as a kind of win, especially if they go on and get some money or go into the world in a different way. Uh, we think that's part of our network generation process. <coughs> Process. So then we go back, put those all together, and we get the, the big map, uh, and those are the, that's the one with the, the names of all the projects on it that were generated in that particular uh, pr pr process. If we go a little bit uh, more, more closely to the sandbox uh, graph itself, so this is the area of the projects that were funded, uh, you, can, you can begin to see the ways in which it's a really complex uh, uh, set of relationships that are formed where the sum is greater than the, than the parts and where value is being enacted, to use Bill's terms, in all kinds of ways through these connections. Each one of these lines represents uh, a, relationship, a new relationship that was formed and where different forms of value are enacted. Uh, um, uh, w we would like to do some more research in the next time we go around this process to actually uh, do some more detailed um, uh, questionnaire work where we actually tried to get at the value of those connections a bit more to people so that we could actually represent that more fully. At the moment we're inferring a lot in the thickness of the lines actually infers stuff about the value of those relationships and what kind of values are being enacted but maybe we might be able to do some more work on that in the future. Um, we can see for instance how both new academic partners and new business partners gained a lot from making lots and lots of contacts. So for instance Dan here is an academic partner, this blob at the bottom, the blob over there above digitizing the dollar princess, the blob up there, that, that dark blue blob. Those three people in particular you might see as people that actually made loads of new connections. Interestingly, we can also see things like, I'm not sure whether this works, uh, we can also see things like the blue blob here in this, in this project Actually, she made lots of, she, that, that academic made lots of connections within her project and brought people into her project, less so with the cohort as a whole. On the other hand, the person over there and the person down there have got lots and lots of different kinds of connections going on that were new connections that they make. So we can start to think about uh, how people, the, 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 the interpersonal dynamics as well within the, within the whole cohort. Over here, this business partner over here and the one right at the top, they also made a lot of new connections as a result of our sandbox project. It was clearly an enriching experience for them and they, that, that's confirmed in the way that they feed back to us on, on this as well. So if we go into a bit more detail, we can look at some specific stories that come out of this. So this is a project called Book Kernel. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a project to produce an event-based publishing service showing the creative and the academic, and it showed, uh, so, so the, the, the project was to put together um, a startup publishing company with an academic to uh, create a service that would allow you to produce a book in a day. That was the, that was the idea for the project. So uh, if they were here today, by the time that you left at five o'clock, they'd have gathered together all the tweets and all the storifications and all the posts and, put it to, and, and lots of the data that already existed and put it together into a book that they would have ready as a nice book, not just as a piece of, a4 print, but as a proper book uh, that they would hand to you as they left. So it's an event-based publishing scheme. So that's the, that's the map of that particular project showing a guy at the top who was actually a contractor. He was brought in as a contractor. He wasn't the uh, lead creative business partner, nor was he the lead academic. He was actually brought in as a, um, as a contractor. And if you begin to see the connections that he has made as a result of the project, you can see that there's all sorts of things that have emerged. Although he was working on his set of connections in his project, he's met loads of other people. And actually for him, as an individual person in the creative economy, this has been a very productive experience because, uh, first of all, the book project itself, the publishing project, not only did the event that we paid for at Cardiff University, which is a, Dylan, a simultaneous Dylan Thomas translation event, but they've also done um, a gig for the BBC in Cardiff, they've done a gig for The Guardian in London, and they've done a gig for the Arts Council and Watershed in Bristol, uh, all of which were piloting and, and showcasing their work. And they all came from that bunch of people in those blobs there. Those gigs all, are, all came because he met people who could offer that work to him. 
He's also set up a new startup business called Fabler with a £3,000 business grant that came not out of his project connection, but out of him meeting another contractor in the sandbox who was working on another project. And they got together and had a great idea, went off and got a business investment to start up another, another business. Uh, he's also worked at an exhibition for Cardiff University, which is with this guy over here. He got a, a job doing some uh, curating of a Cardiff uh, a University uh, uh, exhibition at Cardiff. And uh, he's also worked for one of our other companies uh, over here on uh, writing scripts for a game. So the outcomes that him, for him that emerged from this process were multiple and various. They had all, and there's all kinds of things that happened for him as a result of being in this multiply connected world. Here's another project. This is a project to um, uh, link a, an academic from Cardiff University with an interest in Gothic literature and its physical affect to uh, uh, um, a game, uh, an experience-based game development company. That's to say they make games that are about um, experience rather than consoles. Uh, they work in street situations and public and, uh, and outdoor situations and so on. Um, to produce an immersive game experience where the content is produced from biodata. That was their project. How to make an immersive game experience that used biodata to control content. There's a film of it on our stand outside if you want to know more. It's a pretty interesting piece of work. And this slide shows the contacts between the creatives and the contractors. Uh, and it shows a, a comparatively low number of connections, which confirms for us an intuition that this sandbox process works best and most strongly the first time you do it. Um, the creative down there was part of the original water watershed sandbox in 2009, so he'd already kind of benefited in a way in the startup of his business from the original sandbox and the levels of connectivity and didn't really take advantage of, the, of, the, of what was on offer as much as some of the other people. On the other hand, if we look at the uh, academic who had never been involved in a process like this before, he made lots of, lots of connections and, 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 and actually uh, found out lots of, uh, um, has gone on to do a number of different things, including publishing some academic journal articles based on his experiences. So what I think we're getting towards here is that these visualizations show the richness of the connectivity. These are new working creative relationships that weren't there before. They're multiple. They generate new ideas, new research projects, new businesses, and new products and services. And as you can tell from the new, the more in-depth case studies, unexpected effects and productive connections and different sorts of value are being enacted uh, through this uh, methodology of trying to make a network dynamic, active, and um, curating it in that way. However, this does not happen by accident or without cost. And what I want to do now is to hand over to Simon uh, to talk uh, about what we've learned about our processes that make this productivity possible. What we've seen so far is a kind of structural analysis of what we're doing. I think Simon's going to be able to talk put a bit more flesh on the bones of what we actually do that allows these results to um, come through. Simon. Thank you very much. I'm very creaky today, obviously. Right, so I think we've got... Ah, there you go, that's Anthony Mandel's uh, connections. Even more. Um, and there we go. Yeah, so I started doing some research um, with our various collaborative teams... Uh, towards the end of last year. And we were kind of interested in, or I was particularly interested in, what the experience and the kind of politics and the identities of the people who were coming into the spaces and into our collaborations were. Um, we kind of talk a lot about individuals, we talk a lot about um, teams and networks and so on and so forth, but what was the kind of, I guess, the nuance of the experience in those kind of connections? So, yeah, I did some interviews, I spoke to some people, we kind of had a bit of a think about it, and we came up with sort of this... Uh, um, selection of ideas about curating collaboration, and these are sort of five key learning points that we came out with. And they have kind of formed the backbone of a working paper, which you can download from our uh, website, which has more details. I'm just going to rattle through them now. Um, but we were very aware that if you're doing a culture change project, the kind of people that you get often can be highly institutionalized people. Um, I'm an academic, so I can call myself highly institutionalized, but that's okay. But we do have a particular kind of strong sense of professional identity. And these things 
come with you when you start taking part in a collaborative project, especially ones where you're trying to get people to work differently and act differently and think differently. So when we say be open to the skills of your collaborators, it's also about respecting those identities. And, you know, and creatives and any people from any different kind of institutional background will have those kind of uh, strong um, feelings and skills and ideas about how things should be done. So you've got to respect those and be open to those, but you've also got to be willing to disrupt them as well to kind of get something really new and exciting happening. I mean, what we try and do is that we try and make something happen that couldn't have happened without either partner. So in order to do that, and John's touched on this already, we try and create a protected space, and that's where you bring in all the different expertise um, that you can into that space. It's not just about academic expertise, it's also about businesses, it's about people from the sector in which you're dealing with. So in books and print, we had publishing people, in future documentary, we had documentary makers, we had the BBC and so on. And that costs money, and it takes time, unfortunately, but it is very, very valuable. Because it's also about building trust as well. Because if the people who you're collaborating with or you are supporting as a funder are um, feeling looked after, there's trust, then that's really important because they're more willing to work, they're more willing to put themselves into a project in a way that we know you have to. Whatever work you're in, whether you're in research, whether you're in business, you have to kind of invest yourself in it quite a lot. The other thing is there's a temporal element to all of this as well, which is collaboration is a journey. Um, a lot of times, <coughs> The projects in our sandboxes, the collaborative teams, they may not have worked together before. Sometimes they have, but often they're new to one another. So building that trust and building those kind of moments where you can actually come up with an idea and share it and, and, and run with it and understand how to communicate that to one another takes quite a long time. So although you've got to create a, a protected space of trust, you've also got to let people go through this journey of frustration and happiness and excitement and utter outright misery when nothing's working and then suddenly it is working again. So it's a journey as well. And you need to understand that when you're programming that, that it's also a point of not being too anxious about that, as if you're as a producer, by going, OK, we're going to allow that to happen. We understand that this is where they should be right now. But it's also about building into this idea that no project, we, we use, especially in academia, that projects will start, you will know your outcomes. Well, you'll know your outcomes when you actually start writing your funding bid, which seems a bit counterintuitive. But in this kind of space of innovation, that's not how it operates. And this also ties into this idea of curating people as much as projects. When you have a space where you have sort of six, 12, 18 individuals working in a sandbox cohort on their different projects, you really need to be able to understand who you've got in there, what kind of skills, passions, dispositions, energies that they have and they want to bring to something. And we often find that, um, you know, it's, it's the academics, for example, the historians, they don't bring a particularly dry set of knowledges about a particular period in history. They bring a kind of an energy and understanding of human experience and time and um, interaction, all of these wonderful things. It isn't necessarily specific, I'm bringing my research paper knowledge. It's bringing something else. Same as creatives and coders, you know, they're not necessarily just bringing this ability to write in different kind of languages. They're actually bringing a real ability to problem solve and see the world in a particularly creative way. So you need to value those things. And if you get the right mix of the right people, you can make some really amazing things happen. So the final one, which is to recognize your own fingerprints. Now, this is both in terms of method and in terms of context. In terms of method, we've already talked quite a lot about sort of different discourses and languages that we use, beliefs that we have in how innovation works. We've talked about ecosystems. We've talked about um, trust. I'm doing it already. But you've got to be, understand the way in which those languages into, not interfere, inform the practices that you do, you know, the methods that you carry out. Sandbox is deeply embedded in its, own, in its own politics of Bristol watershed, its own past and its own histories. And that's not a bad thing, but you just have to be aware of it because that will help you communicate things better, respond better and adapt better so that your methods change with the ideas that you're supporting as they change. And in terms of recognising your fingerprints in terms of context, it's also about recognising the broader politics of what it is that we're doing. Um, we are a knowledge exchange hub, but arguably I like to think there's no such thing as knowledge exchange, just the thing that we call knowledge exchange. And by that I mean it's had lots of different names before, it'll have lots of different names in the future, but it has a very particular political space and a particular kind of political work that it does. And that's the same as anything, impact and so on and so forth. And that's not a bad thing again. You just have to understand with sensitivity the fields you're working in, because it's more than just about making exciting things happen in the cultural and higher education sectors. It's also about all the other things that happen when we talk about higher education, collaboration, economy, creativity and culture. So it's about knowing about those things and being sensitive to those things. So I kind of say that it's really about kind of knowing what you're asking people to do and knowing what you're asking people to be in these collaborations as well. John. So.
if we were to give ourselves a short epitaph, this is from one, the six word epitaph is from one of our projects, a little bit of project plug, Future Cemetery, they worked with a, a cemetery who wanted to turn themselves into a heritage site. So it was a, somebody from Bath University who comes from the Centre for Death and Dying Studies, such a thing exists, and uh, they were tuned up with a, a media production company, worked with a, 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 an amazing cemetery that's a bit like Highgate in, um, in Bristol at Brislington. And one of the things I asked people to do was to compose a six-word epitaph on their way into this uh, experience for themselves using words like fridge magnet letters, essentially, which then became translated into a, a digital projection and then appeared on trees as you were walking around the cemetery. Um, so our epitaph might be, first of all, be open to new forms of emergent value. Value can take many different forms. And in order to make our system work, we have to be open to lots of forms of value that might emerge through the relationships. What happened for the example that I told you earlier on about the contractor who was brought in, immense value produced for him in all kinds of ways, from a level of personal development to the level of economic development, through having a network system where, these, where sharing and peer-to-peer -peer learning is encoded into the process. Secondly, maintain your network. Look after your network, look after the people in it. It, it has to become, we think, a high quality, high value experience for them personally. And we put a lot of effort, and our producers, especially the producers that, that, we, that, were, that were employed by the, by, by the watershed to work for us on this project, or work with us on this project, I should say, um, put a lot of effort into making, maintaining their network and making it a high quality experience for people. And finally, to quote uh, our great absent partner today, Claire Reddington, who's jetting in even as we speak from South by Southwest so that she can be at the launch of our object sandbox on Thursday. Curate diversity, very important idea. Get the right mix of different people in the room uh, and work with them quite intensively. So that more or less sums up what we have to say to you. Those are Bill's references for anybody who would like to follow that up. We can make those available later on, should you desire to. And we'd be very happy to have a short uh, conversation with you now. If you have any questions or comments or things you'd like to ask us or suggest or comments or feedback. Um, I don't know where we are for time. I'm sort, of, I'm sort of assuming we've got at least five minutes for a quick exchange and we can follow up afterwards if you would like to. Also, just like to make sure that you've got some of these. If you haven't, this is the official launch of our of our um, catalogue. Please take one and pass it on. Come and see us afterwards if you haven't got one. Uh, uh, and, that's, and that's where you'll find the fruit of the, of the theory that we've been discussing, as it were. That's where the proof, uh, the, pud the puddings that prove our case are, in ca are in contained in that, uh, in that catalogue. So, questions, comments? I can see somebody vague at the back there, yeah? Karen Lewis, University of South Wales, it's now on, I can hear it. Um, just one question there, John, well, to any of you really. I was interested in, um, in terms of the benefits to academics and your creative businesses, what, do you get a sense from the data and, and your research of what the balance is? Would you say it's been mutually beneficial to date or the business sector have benefited more? This is a question that's been raised um, with some projects I've been involved in recently, so I'd be interested in your thoughts. Simon will have a more nuanced answer because he's the person who has to spend his head deep in the data a lot more. My, my headline impression is that actually that's very project by project. Uh, and actually, if you go back to the, to the slide uh, with the sandbox connectivity, I would say that the balance of benefit could more or less be inferred, and I think probably accurately, from, from the number of connections and it, it, that, that, people, that people make within it. So... Uh, um, yeah, so, 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 I, so I wouldn't say that there's a, there's a, there's a consistent um, answer to that question. Uh, I think it's really project by project. I think that in terms of the kinds of benefits as well, it's obviously going to be a different proposition for an academic to become involved with React than it is um, a business, especially given we kind of, we're hoping to produce new kinds of uh, prototype or products, whatever it might be. Um, also, because we're not a research... Um, initiative as such in terms of, the, you know, sometimes academics come in thinking that they're going to do some research, but really that doesn't tend to happen. It's actually new ways of working and new ways of communicating. And we see that there's much more of a mutual benefit where, with those academics that really kind of understand 
that kind of output, that it's about teaching, communication, new ways of embodying the knowledge that they have and the ways that they see the world and actually sharing that. And actually we see that a lot of the really successful projects really do enjoy finding new ways to go and share those knowledges out there. Um, businesses, I mean, it can be anything from just a number of connections you make with other people. It could be new ways of working. Um, and especially for younger startups or, or micro businesses, there's more of a tangible, I think, um, benefit for them. It's more visible in terms of work that they get, commissions that they find, other people they connect with. But I don't think that it's necessarily um, less valuable or more valuable than it is for academics in that context as well. It's just a different kind of value, I think. Okay. Okay, yes. Oh, yes, Dr. Wang from Shanghai. Welcome. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Uh, I am very interested in this special form of organization of creative economy uh, and in the dynamic process, uh, the network makes the hub emerge and the hub uh, strengthens the network. So my question is, what is the most important element in this interaction? Uh, which makes the hub and the network mutual benefit. Thank you. I, I, would, I would say the most important uh, element in the interaction that makes that work um, is the appointment and the agency of producers. So we've, we have specifically appointed creative producers whose role is to, make, is to manage and curate that network. So that it's the people that we put into that, into, that, into that role and the way we design those job descriptions and the way that those, those play out. You may have something to say about that, Bill. I don't know about, about the role, that, about what, what, what you think is the most important element. Yeah, this, this focus on the role of the producer came out of quite a long period of dialogue that we had with uh, Claire Riddington and, and Dick about how do you, what do you do to manage a network? What's the meaning of that word? And it really emerged that the creative role of the producer rather than a project manager was the critical element of forming, bringing resources together around a creative intent. And so that is what actually creates the interactional power, which then, you know, the more they, they come together, the more they mutually support one another. So you're absolutely right that the hub and the network mutually strengthen one another. And the critical management function of the hub is the role of the producer. There's, there's something, I guess, you know, to maintain a good social network, what do you have to do? You have to spend a lot of time actually pinging back to people, communicating with people, making sure that every message you get is responded to. Similarly, to create a good creative network, you've got to spend a lot of time making sure that the, the producer has to spend a lot of time making sure that they're in touch with the people who are engaged in the process most of the time on a regular basis. They know where they're at, they know what's going on, they know what they need, they know if they've got a problem, how they can solve it, they know if there's more funding available to them that they can plug them into it, those kinds of things. So again, it's about the, the producer's role in that is really keeping in touch and looking after um, looking after the people that are involved in the process. And that is a two-level process. I think there's been other theoretical and, ex and experimental work done on other hubs, um, not just a creative economy, that it's the dual focus both on the experience of the individual participant at the level of the person and their organisation, but then also working on the horizontal level of the network and curating that as well. And maintaining that dual focus is, the crit is absolutely critical. Thank you. I guess we should. Oh no, go on. There's one. There's one. One more question now. I think. I don't know. Is anybody? Is anybody keeping time in the in the in the building here for us? <laughs> We're just going to go on. Okay, fine. Yes, brilliant. Is that? Yeah. Is that yeah. That? Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the presentation again. Um, um, I'm coming from Moscow, Russia, and um, welcome. We we don't really have. Um, this is not too popular. I mean, the hub structures are not too popular, but I know lots of people who are trying to organize things like these. And the question that I have is probably, is this more of a social initiative? Is this more of a supplement to some major kind of business you're doing apart from this? Or is this the uh, basic thing that you're in involved in? If you, if, I don't know if I'm making myself clear. So could this be 
a business as a business, or is this more of a social initiative as a supplement to something that... Oh, okay. I mean, you know, that people are, you know, most people are probably more interested in the income, in the financial benefit. Um, could this be um, a business to gain profits, to earn money, or should this be something that rather is a supplement to that? And is this something that could emerge as a start-up with people with quite... Um, few experience with little experience, but lots of connections. Or do you think that should this should be run by people with quite a lot of experience and quite a lot of connections already? Great question. Um, the first part, there's, there's two parts to it. One is the business, but could it be a business at any level of experience? Um, I guess we might all have things to say about this, because it's, it's a very interesting question. Okay, so there are people in, in London, not far from here, who, who run something, who run co-location studios as a business. So they, their, their business model is get lots of creatives together in the room, share, 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 charge you lots of rent, and make a business out of it. But it's, you know, it's quite successful. It's quite, you know, it's quite a good business. Um, the, ne the next level is, 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 would you, is, is would we take any IP and any, and any share in, in um, what, um, what our partners produce? And that would be another business model where we could turn it into a business. Our position is that, no, we don't want to do that because actually we're, we're, we're upstream from IP, right? We're bef we're, we get people together who are trying to work out what their IP is. Have I even got any IP? Is there anything interesting here that I can explore? We're about the ideas generation process. And I think we think that actually in order to do that properly and creatively and appropriately for the dynamics of the creative economy space that we're in, we need to not be saying to people, and we're going to grab some of your IP. Actually, other people and other hubs here today take a different view. In Dundee, the Dundee hub, for instance, they do retain some of the IP of the, of the things that they produce with the idea that they'll actually get some income back from them in the end. So far, we haven't done that. There is a possibility that we could consider doing that, but we haven't done it so far because we've been concentrating on the ideas generation part of the process. Um, my own view is that because we work with micro businesses and startups, it's appropriate for the state to be involved in, um, in, in, in seeding and supporting that area uh, because some of those seeds and some of those people will become the backbone of the 9% of the creative economy that Rick Rylance was talking about this morning. So it's entirely appropriate that the state should support that. It's not a social mission, it's a business investment on the part of the state to grow businesses. Does anybody else have things, you probably have other things to say about that? Oh, I think that's enough. That's good. We're, we're up to time anyway, we just had a... Shut up. Yeah. <laughs> a little face appeared at the door. And... Okay. Okay, we, that, well, that's, that's, that's the end of our time. We'll be here all day. Our stand's just outside the door in the main hall. If you want to come and talk to us some more, please make sure that you get one of these and then you'll find out a lot more about the substance of what we, what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you for your attention and thanks to my co-presenters.